Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm also somebody who usually roams around the room, so I'm going to do my best to not drive you guys crazy uh, or the sound people. Here's the deal, folks. Anybody else here share some obsessive compulsive traits? All right. I'm not fully diagnosable. This actually helps you get through graduate school and run a business to have just enough of that anxiety stuff. You have twice as many slides as we're going to get through. The reason for that is I'm giving you all of the principles from the book at the end so you don't have to buy the book. I know I'm not a very good business person. <laughs> we're going to skip through a lot of slides and hopefully we can have a little fun. And also, if you brought your knitting or embroidery, you don't have to hide it under the table. You can feel free to bring it up and do it in public, okay? All right. Hopefully we're going to have a little fun here. A child might have executive function weaknesses. It's one of my personal favorites. If she completes work but forgets to hand it in. We're not even talking about all the pain and suffering for how the homework got done the night before. And I mean, or how it actually physically got to school. All right. So just imagine this. I know we're here on a Saturday, but school will be open again soon. There will be a child on Monday sitting in her seat. Her homework will be within a very close radius of her body. Are you with me so far? The teacher may even say, please turn in your math homework. What does she do? Nothing. Was there a noise in here? Those, those new shoes you've got? All right. Is this really a problem with forgetting? Well, actually, it's probably more of this broader executive function problem. When I talk to kids about this, it's always curious. And I'm not here to brag, but you know what? I at least developmentally had good executive skills. I didn't do anything to deserve these. My parents didn't put them in me, and it's not because I'm so smart. My IQ is in the triple digits. I am bragging a little bit. I'm over 100. OK. But you know what? It took me forever to understand this. How could you not turn your homework in, right? Is there any rational reason? Is there a logical explanation for this? For most students, there's only going to be a possible negative consequence for not turning your homework in. All right. As we've already heard, you know, these kids have trouble transitioning, right? From thinking about math to thinking about English from the rules at mom's house to the rules at dad's house, for how you talk to a peer and how you talk to a grown-up, right? It's that cognitive flexibility shifting, the shifting gears function. I just saw a six-year-old who got in a bit of trouble a couple weeks ago. Uh, he actually has Asperger's, which not everybody has, believe it or not. Does everybody have Asperger's up in Canada, too, or is that just a US problem we have right now? <laughs> Again, this is a verifiable condition. And this kid has what certainly looks like Asperger's. Um, and uh, he got in trouble. Why? He went over to his first grade teacher, who was talking to a colleague. He looked at her and said, excuse me, at least he had good manners. Every second you're talking to this other teacher, you're wasting our recess time. <laughs> and we have to kind of work on figuring out those unspoken social rules, right? Transitioning also requires other executive skills, planning and organization. Because to get to your locker or wherever you keep your stuff at school and to plan out what you can put back and what you'll need for the coming classes takes a lot of that internal structuring, the internal cueing. A child might have executive function weaknesses if he doesn't seem to catch, quote, careless errors. I have that in quotation, since I think all errors are careless by definition. What does this relate to? It relates to the inhibition or impulse control, right? Being able to slow yourself down enough to think about things. All right. This also relates to self-monitoring. We've already heard a lot about the brain's quality control system. Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Oh, I guess the teacher wanted me to do all of the problems on the test, not just every other one. All right. Oh, there's a whole page I missed here. I'm talking a lot about academics because kids spend a lot of time in school, and these weaknesses can cause a lot of functional difficulties. There's also big social and other implications. A child might have executive function weaknesses if she needs more external support and reminder than peers. And in fact, in our work with parents, I don't want people to feel hopeless. I know they may be feeling frustrated. 
But for a lot of these folks, regardless of their intelligence and their effort, would you agree that a lot of these folks are gonna need more support for a longer period of time or some things done differently until they either have the brain maturation or get systems in place and arrange things so they can function better? Now, that doesn't mean they can't leave the house or do things, but is everybody with weak executive skills gonna be ready to be fully functional as an adult at age 18 or even 21? Not a lot of the folks I see. So the parents need, I hate to tell you this, to have a realistic understanding. Where should the expectations be? Well, it's not to have expectations that are too low. There's problems with that. But you know, don't, you can't compare your kid with ADHD to your kid without ADHD, right? Not only are they different temperaments and people, but it may be that that other kid is gonna be on a faster track. In fact, that's likely with uh, relationship to these executive skills. Child might have executive function weaknesses if he can't seem to keep track of directions and stuff. Are you familiar with this? All right, what was that again? This is, I bring this up because it's really important to note, as I think Dr. Brown already did, that these executive skills don't live in isolation, right? There's emotional components. They overlap with every other cognitive skill, with problem solving, with reasoning, with language, with memory. So what is keeping track of directions? It's a language task. There's a memory component. And the executive function component is that keeping it in mind, keeping track. Last but certainly not least on this slide, she is very inconsistent in her performance. Again, this variability, is it fair to say it drives us crazy? You can do something well on one day, another day on a task that seems actually pretty similar, they do poorly. This is used against kids in school, and by the way, I'm married to a public school teacher, so I'm not here to pick on teachers. What do they say? She could do a great job on that paper. She did an awesome job. In fact, it was of interest to her, so she even planned it well. She attended to details. It's, a, it's an awesome paper. What happens on the next paper? Not so good. What does that mean? She has the capability to do the work. Therefore, we should expect her to do that quality work all the time, right? Wrong. We have to, again, expect and uh, support kids. There's going to be this level of variability that can be quite frustrating. Okay, we already talked about a lot of these things. Um, so I'm just gonna go very quickly, you can all read. You know, there's not, I think it's impossible to have actually a comprehensive list of executive skills, so we just wanna make sure that you have an understanding of all of the different self-regulatory cognitive control skills that we put under this very broad umbrella term. My second bullet here, plan, organize, initiate, sequence, and monitor. How important are those skills alone for traditional school success? Do you think they may actually be more important than quote unquote native intelligence, than enrichment and even some environmental factors? They're, they're pretty important. All right. Did any of you say in third grade have a class on task initiation, impulse control, and self-monitoring? <laughs> it's actually a good idea, but do um, you know some kids, some third graders who could desperately use that? Very explicit explanation but not just talking, modeling, practice, and reinforcement. All right. And this is hard for some of us with obsessive compulsive features, but we're just gonna go through these things very quickly. All right. This happens to be um, the model, along with Dr. Brown's, that we, just, we based our book on. Again, just not that these are all separate things. They're not, but just to be able to talk about them, we wanted to narrow them down. Challenges of teaching and parenting these kids can really be viewed, as many people have talked about, as a hidden disability or weakness, right? Can a teacher tell by looking at a kid if they have executive function weaknesses? Not most of the time. This variability does make it challenging to differentiate between true skill and developmental deficits and poor effort or motivation. And of course, it's more complicated than that, isn't it? How many of you know kids who were trying pretty hard when they started school? And they really kept trying and trying, and what happened? Their unevenness, or even their failure experiences, over time, 
I mean they're not trying so hard, right? Motivation is a really complicated thing. All right. Some kids respond with more and more effort, and in fact, many of those kids, not all, develop anxiety disorders that are quite disabling. Other kids say what at some point? I don't think this school thing is really for me anyways, right? They check out. Now I'm gonna tell you, I'm trained in behavioral principles, and, and some of our best non-medical tools are in the behavioral area, right? What do we do when somebody's having trouble getting started? We reinforce them for doing so. What do we do if somebody's having trouble sticking with something for 15 minutes? We have them do it for five minutes. We change the environment. You, I'm sure you're quite familiar with these behavioral principles. Here's the issue, though. Do behavioral principles in both natural or unnatural imposed work for all kids and take care of all these issues? No. Do you know any kids or have a model at home who you have really tried good, solid behavioral plans that are supposed to work for kids with ADHD, but your kid apparently didn't understand this and still had trouble? And again, sometimes the behavior plan isn't individualized. Do you have any of those kids? All right. In that case, we're going to have to do some different things. But there's a few more challenges. Yes, they know what to do but they have trouble doing it consistently and independently. The, when I have parents or teachers, <coughs> excuse me, or others having trouble understanding this, there's a very simple example I use that at least a couple of people in the room can probably identify with. Have any of you tried to change your exercise or eating habits ever? Am I the only one? Okay, there's three of us. The rest of you just listen, okay? All you have to do is know what good nutrition is, right? And know what the best exercise routine would be for your age and your medical profile. And then you just do it. Is that how it works? <laughs> no. Anybody else been to the gym uh, the day after New Year's? <laughs> there is a line for the broken rowing machine. You can get a little shard of time. I know, I've done this 35 years in a row now. Okay. Is the gym still open in August? Does anybody know the answer to that question? <laughs> All right. Now, I'm not making fun, but again, if adults who have a lot more life experience and a lot more resources have trouble changing their independent performance, developing habits and routines, why would we expect that just based on a lecture, a kid would be able to do this? That's what we do, right? We can't help ourselves. I've done this. What you really need to remember is that it's really important for your, to turn your homework in. It's really important to put your name on the test, see? If you don't put your name on the test, you won't get credit. You, you can't play soccer if you don't bring your soccer equipment. All right, they know what to do. This is just my clinical experience. This is not research-based, folks. I want to be clear about that. But, you know, in trying to tease this out, what can happen? Some of these folks cannot predict how they've done. And I don't mean they're in denial, all right? I mean they truly believe, oh man, I studied so hard for that geometry quiz. I've never studied so hard. I felt good, right? I was in the zone. It's awesome. Guess how, how I did? C. Next time, barely prepare, similar result. Some of these kids, and we're mainly talking about kids today, but it's true of adults too, actually, because of their self-monitoring weaknesses, I don't mean because they're having huge psychiatric issues, they actually do like, uh, lack insight or awareness of their own metacognitive processes. May have trouble getting started and keeping going, seem more vulnerable to external factors, as we've already heard, right? Well, yeah, I can... Lori, are you saying that my kid has ADHD? You're just flat out wrong. He can play Legos, that's my favorite example, for 15 hours without blinking. Yes, we're not talking about ability to attend and independently manage the fun stuff, right? We're talking about work. We're talking about non-preferred tasks. The one variable I have to mention here, and I'm gonna skip a few more slides, is teacher fit. Again, this is not, I don't know if there's research on this. This is maybe more common sense. You know, I appreciate research, but I am telling you, if there is one factor I can identify as far as school success, 
for children and adolescents, and it's actually still true in college and graduate school and beyond, is that that personality of that instructor, the flexibility, right, the fit with that particular kid. And of course, there's no one fit, right? Some kids do best, they thrive with a teacher who others would characterize as overly rigid, overly structured. That's what they do well with, all right? Other kids, they need somebody who's so vivacious and full of humor and so spontaneous who maybe like forgets to do their copying before class, all right? That's kind of an issue, all right? Now, at least in our schools, we can't tell an administrator, make sure you put this kid in this class. I don't know if things are different here, but politically, you can't do that. What we do in our reports, though, is say, this student will do best with a teacher who has experience and has been successful with students with this, this, and this. All right, you don't have the cartoons here because I pay copyright fees for this. This is Philosophy 101. Our kid has brought his Plato instead of his Plato. Yuck, yuck, yuck. So after we have a speech and language pathologist, make sure that he can hear the difference between the tut and duh. This is how these, some of these kids feel. And this is not an excuse. I want to be clear. This is not an excuse for inadequate effort. We're not saying that everybody who underachieves, or I'm not saying, it's because of biological executive function weaknesses. But does anybody like this feeling? Anybody ever been in a meeting, for example? I'm sure this has never happened to you, so just listen. You're in a meeting, and the meeting is starting, and you realize, holy cow, I was supposed to do something for this meeting. Has that ever happened to a few other humans out there? Do you love that feeling? It's great. Soon my colleagues will come in. I have no excuse. Boy, I'm just feeling really uncomfortable, right? Some of these kids experience this out of sync, unprepared feeling an awful lot, and it's quite unpleasant. I don't want to be all deficit oriented here. That is kind of what we still do in testing often. Figuring out what is right. Again, I'm talking for long-term adjustment and happiness. Yes, I'm actually talking about happiness, not just like what kind of job you get. You know, those kids who in fact are likable, right? Those kids who are engaging, I hate to say this, I'm showing my biases. You know the kids who like to please the grown-ups? You know those kids? I love working with those kids. What's not to like, right? They're working hard almost all the time. All right. Those adaptive social and coping skills, some of those other strengths, that really makes a difference, right? Just saw a kid who was struggling, but you know what? She's a nationally ranked musician. And it doesn't take away her ADD or the struggles with homework and even some of the social issues she's having. But you know what? She has something that is both so motivating and interesting and that she's so good at and enjoys. That's going to be a strength that, that helps her compensate. Now again, I'm a social scientist by training. I'm all for the figuring out the why. But I'm just going to recommend, based on my experience, you can forget about these questions of your children and adolescents. I mean it. Why didn't you, some of you have said this, right? I've said this to my nine-year-old Emma. Why didn't you turn in your homework? Do you think they know when they're doing this on purpose? No, they don't know. Well, it's probably because some weak executive skills. I think it's more prefrontal lobe development issues, Mom. <laughs> Why didn't you bring your clarinet to class? Why didn't you put your name on the test? You know, one thing I've learned so much from parents actually just sharing a lot of their distress and pain, and I don't think that's too, too strong a way to talk about this, is that sometimes their spouse, sometimes the teacher, sometimes their psychologist assumes, you know what, this really is just a lack of motivation. I don't even like this term motivation. Again, we've been studying motivation for 100 plus years. Do, you really, do we understand what makes somebody intrinsically motivated towards academic learning and, or how to change that? I think it still is, is a very uh, complicated question. One thing I've realized, though, in working with many parents is their neighbors and their families sometimes really don't get it. They're trying, and they'll say, oh, don't worry. All fourth graders put off doing their projects. Yes, but for that particular parent, we may be talking about a totally different intensity and frequency, right? Oh, don't worry. A lot of adolescents kind of make stupid decisions sometimes. 
Yes, but when you've got a kid with ADHD and these related executive function weaknesses, some of the other people in your life may not really understand what happens in your house. All right. Okie doke. Another funny, your mother and I are feeling overwhelmed, so you'll have to bring yourselves up. <laughs> I only have one kid who doesn't have ADHD, but apparently I was feeling a little stressed. I hope I'm not offending anybody. <clears throat> They're like, you can't do that. I'm like, watch us, no. <laughs> Don't do this, it's only a joke, people. Let go of the why, focus on the what. What does she need to get this job done? What do you think is realistic to expect for independent behavior and what kinds of supports, accommodations, modifications can we put in place? And importantly, what can we do to help her build her internal competence? Think about the how. Again, I'm gonna skip through a number of things, I apologize. And again, I, I wish I were more familiar with how you deal with kids with disabilities in Canada. I'm, I'm learning a little bit from talking with folks. I won't skip the funnies, don't worry people. I don't have to be smart because someday I'll just hire lots of smart people to work for me. Now again, this really is crucial because in school we expect kids to be good at everything, right? A lot of us, not everybody, but a lot of us as adults will specialize more, right? There's a reason that I make my living by reading, writing, talking, listening, and kind of thinking and working with really generally very interesting people, rather than being a marathon runner or trying to be an Olympic athlete. Psychologist fits better with my personal profile and my interests. Can you imagine what it's like to go to work every day and be doing something that is constantly calling on a constellation of weaknesses? It's a pretty stressful way to go through life. Not everybody has a choice. I, I realize that there's people who just have to work to support themselves and their families, and the work they do is not inherently interesting. I do want to mention the social world here. All right. Now it's pretty clear, kids who are impulsive have trouble waiting their turn, are too talkative. You know, in kindergarten, kids just are meant to be impulsive. I mean without ADHD. Anybody been in a kindergarten class lately? There's a lot of impulsive behavior. In fact, I was observing at a kindergarten last week. Kids actually just, without ADHD, they just spontaneously fall off their chairs from time to time. Have you seen this? <laughs> It's not just a U.S. problem. I'm like, what is, you know, it's low to the ground. They're little chairs, so they just get back up. Nobody's hurt. It's fine, okay? Now, can you have ADHD and be a good friend? Absolutely. I don't want to stereotype. In fact, it's fun to play with some kids with ADHD, especially with the impulsive type, right? It's also good to have one of them around to get caught doing what all the other kids were doing five minutes before the teacher walked in the room, and they're still, I'm not recommending scapegoating, but that happens, right? She's right behind me, isn't she? Yes, she is. <laughs> All right. But if you're in fourth grade, you're in sixth grade, and you're still constantly interrupting, there may be fewer birthday party invitations, right? All right. But let's talk not just about these impulsive kids, but those kids who have the shifting gears problem, whether they have an Asperger's autism diagnosis or not. Those kids with cognitive rigidity, right, who remain all or nothing thinkers longer than we expect who have trouble figuring out the unspoken social rules. And again, there's plenty of kids with ADHD who are always kind of one step behind, right, in figuring out exactly what's going on. These are the kids who do this. Bus driver, she's chewing gum. It's against the rules. I know, but she's the biggest, meanest eighth grader we've ever had at the school. All right, but it's against the rules. All right, they may appear what, blunt? Insensitive, boy, that's a huge pimple on your nose. Don't say that to a high school student. Male, female, doesn't matter, all right? When my daughter was little, you know what? We taught her absolute rules. When Emma was three, we taught her things like always tell the truth, never lie. Because cognitively, no matter how gifted a kid is, that's where a three-year-old's at, right? We need to teach them the absolutes. Do you always tell the truth? Did you have to have a class for somebody to explain the exceptions to this rule? Probably not. Just by being part of the world, implicit learning, watching other people, figure it out. Do all kids have executive dysfunction? No, only middle schoolers. I know you don't have middle schools consistently, but they're actually, it's actually a mental illness. Are you familiar with middle schoolers? 
6th, 7th, 8th graders. It's just an odd time developmentally. I had a mom call me up not long ago. Oh, Dr. Dietzel, I'm so glad to have reached you personally. Well, I don't have a secretary. I answer my own phone. So, yes, I'm sure my four-year-old has executive dysfunction. <gasps> like, this sounds serious. <laughs> we need to get her in as soon as possible. Money is no object. Like, really? OK. <laughs> Who are you? So I talk with this woman, of course not with this tone of voice. And I mean, I was on the phone with her for an embarrassingly long period of time, getting more information, right? Because I don't like to do testing on a four-year-old unless there's a really good reason to do so. All right. So this youngster, this four-year-old girl, is already has good pre-academic, beginning academic skills. She's in a very enriched home environment, an excellent preschool. She has great friends. You know, I try asking my crucial diagnostic questions. You ready? What about circle time, huh? <laughs> Problems in circle time? <laughs> no, she's a model student. Oh, OK. What about sleep, huh? Poorly regulated? No. She's great. OK. What about, have you checked with the teacher? Yeah, she has no concerns. So after this long interview, I asked, why do you think your four-year-old has executive dysfunction? What did this mom say? Because she leaves a trail of belongings behind her wherever she goes. And I have to remind her twice before she'll clean up her room. I'm like, only twice? Awesome. Tell me what you do. <laughs> now, you can have executive delays when you're in preschool. Often, you'll see it in the basic self-regulation, impulse control, right? Working memory is still not developed at the level we expect. But no. Most kids, as we've seen from the research, are developing executive skills at the appropriate pace as they're developing language skills. A complicating factor I just want to throw out here, this is more of a day-long talk, is there's a lot of environmental demands that may actually be out of sync with what we call normal development. You don't do that around here, right? You expect kids to read by the time they're four, to write with a pencil by the time they're five, and to be able to perfectly manage long-term projects by the time they're six. I'm exaggerating only slightly, right? But we're talking, when we're talking about biological developmental brain-based delays, that's not saying the kid's expected to do too much and is really 